The way that barrels are made has scarcely changed in the past 500 years. The hewing of wood, the careful shaping of a completely wine-tight container with fire and water, are crafts that relate directly to the old way of building a boat. Both represent the high technology of the Middle Ages. Even non-producing countries drank wine in quantities that needed a whole fleet of small ships to carry it. The problem was that it turned to vinegar within a year. This program is about the transport of wine and the discovery of the first kind that would keep. To England, the wine fleet was specially important. First of all, to the king, because it provided, of course, his pleasure and his comfort and a very special present that he could give his friends. But much more than that, it provided his income. At one point in the Middle Ages, his income from taxing wine was as much as all the rest of his revenue combined. And there was even more to it than that. Wine held the king's army together, especially before battles. And perhaps most important of all, it provided the basis for the first northern navies. What else was there, after all, in those days that needed substantial ships in large numbers with skillful crews to man them? Wine was, in fact, the bulk commodity of the time, rather the way oil is today. Even today, the capacity of a ship is measured in tons. In other words, how many big barrels of wine it could carry. Of all the regular wine routes of the Middle Ages, the most important was from Bordeaux to England. For three centuries, they were in effect one kingdom, England and Aquitaine, and the English drank almost the entire crop of the Bordeaux vineyards. A few years ago, I retraced the route on the nearest sort of ship to an old wine trader that could be found, the Bark Marquise. Bigger than most medieval cogs, as they were called, but subject to just the same sailing conditions in the notoriously rough Bay of Biscay. In the English Channel, we hit some of the dirty weather we expected. It blew up to force 10, a gale and a half by landlubbers' standards. This is the way millions of barrels of claret, as we still call it, reached England. And a proportion didn't. As many as 400 ships would congregate in the port of Bordeaux each October to collect the new wine and rush it to England in a sort of medieval Beaujolais race. This is the great estuary of the Gironde. Let me draw you a map. This is the Atlantic coast here. And the estuary comes out to sea widening like this. Now, all that land here between the estuary and the Atlantic is the Medoc. Bordeaux is this cross here. Down to Bordeaux, winding from inland, is the river Garonne. It comes down from an area known as the High Country. Now, in that high country, there are famous wine names like Caor and Gaillac, whose wines are, in fact, better in the Middle Ages than the wines of Bordeaux, and the people of Bordeaux knew it. So they were quite ruthless in preventing the wines using their natural course down the river and out to sea to export. They simply stopped them here in Bordeaux. However, there's another river, the Dordogne, which winds down here and joins the estuary below Bordeaux. So there wasn't much the people of Bordeaux could do about that. And on that river was the famous wine town of Saint-Emilion. Saint-Emilion lies on a limestone ridge above the Dordogne Valley. Here and in the country round, the wines they made were, and still are, 
a degree more alcoholic than the very light wines of Bordeaux city. Alcohol helped them to travel better. And the same limestone that gave them extra strength provided them with perfect cellars for cool fermentation, a factor in keeping them stable. In fact, the whole town of Saint-Emilion is a warren of these caverns. Many of them are lined with the barrels of the chateau and vineyards directly overhead. Others are catacombs with tombs going back, as legend has it, to the hermit, Saint Emilianus, who gave the town its name. His bones are here. The sepulchre of the legendary saint leads directly into Saint Emilion's most remarkable monument. J'appelle Monsieur Derek Nemo. A whole church quarried into the solid limestone. The underground church is today's meeting place for the Jorade de Saint-Emilion, the organization for the promotion of the town and its wine. Enrolling the occasional celebrity, actor or politician is good for propaganda. Monsieur Nimo, vous êtes acteur, vous êtes comédien, Vous êtes metteur en scène et vous êtes également auteur. Ce dont je doute pas de toute façon de bien vouloir vous accepter au sein des membres de la jurade. Monsieur le procureur s'indique s'il vous plaît. Messieurs les jurats, jurez-vous de donner à votre vigneron d'honneur de la jurade. He is invited into the bosom of the brotherhood. Votre dévouement fraternel. Alors, pour être tenté, oui, voilà. C'est joli. Une épitome. Théoriquement, en fait, c'est rapide. Non, pas rapide. Bon, let us say it. I mean, put a bit of black on it. I mean, okay. And English leopards, c'est le sceau de la commune de Saint-Émilion. When can I wear this then? Everywhere where you have an official Saint Emilion ceremony. I see. Which yeah. is in many places in England anyway. The Jorade was founded in the year 1200 as the jurisdictional body of the town by King John of Magna Carta fame. He was as loved in Aquitaine as he was despised in England. John inherited as his realm most of Western France, as well as England. They were to remain united for a period of almost 300 years. It was claret that gave Saint-Emilion its importance. To this day, claret is a uniquely English word. It means the clear light wine that was ready for shipping early to be in every town in England in time for Christmas. Once a barrel was broached, though, it went off in a matter of weeks. When it was too vinegary to drink, they added honey. On the King's Tower in Saint-Emilion, the Jorad still proclaims the good news of the new vintage of fresh claret, the staple drink of medieval England.
The Middle Ages did know one kind of wine that kept for years on end, but it had to come from the ends of the earth. This is Santorini in the Eastern Mediterranean, the extraordinary remnant of one of the world's most tremendous volcanoes that rises as a crescent of sheer rock a thousand feet above the deepest crater on earth. Wines from the Eastern Mediterranean, from islands such as Crete and Cyprus, were known by the name of Malmsey. They were strong wines from grapes ripened to intense sweetness and durable as no claret ever was. Santorini's summer-long drought and never-ending winds meant that even the tough vine had to be plaited into a little crouching nest to survive. One by one, these vineyard islands fell into the hands of the advancing Islamic empire of the Turks. In most, the laws of the prophet put an end to wine growing, not in Santorini, where nothing else would grow, and wine paid the taxes. This odd little structure, rather like a baby Russian church in a way, with its cross-shaped roof, covers a ventilation shaft. It's the clue that led me to one of the most strangely sighted cellars that I've ever seen. The grapes all had to be carried down this path on donkey back. They made Vicento, sweet and strong. Paradoxically, the holy wine of the Russian church. Being a Turkish colony, Santorini had access to Turkish sea routes. The island's legendary seamen took the northern route through the Black Sea to Odessa and Russia. The size of these now abandoned cellars shows the devotion of the Russian flock. When the wine was made, they had to take it back along the track and down the cliff to waiting ships. I'd love to have been there to see them do it, handling all those barrels and mules. But the Russian Revolution put an end to this flourishing export trade. And eventually, the Turks lost Santorini. For centuries, the Mediterranean has been an intermittent battleground between Christian and Muslim. At the other end of the Mediterranean, Christian Spain had struggled against Islam for 700 years. Eventually, the Knights of the Cross drove the Moors back to North Africa. They left behind a devastated war-torn land, but a cultural heritage that has scarcely faded. the victorious Spanish in Andalusia were faced with a fertile but depopulated country. To encourage settlers, the king gave them huge grants of land where they planted vines. Their wines soon became the substitute for the Malmsey from the eastern Mediterranean. The most famous was Sherry Sack. From the town, the Arabs called Sherish, and the Spanish, Jerez. Some of the descendants of the victorious knights still farm the parched chalk soil 700 years later. Other families that came to exploit the special qualities of this land included the Domex from France, perhaps the most famous Sherry family of all. So Sherry really was created at a moment of history which is long gone now, I mean, it's 400 years or so. But English do, do you think that a historical moment could pass? That, that is needed? a question which has been made before. I am so much uh, in love with this wine and I think that its quality and its image is so big that I think that something like that cannot disappear. It will always be more or less popular but it will always exist.
Only 20 miles from the town of Jerez lies the Bordeaux of southern Spain, its greatest wine port of the Middle Ages. It's really hard to believe that this ordinary bucket and spade beach was once Europe's Cape Canaveral, the launching place for expeditions of discovery far more important than merely reaching the moon. This is San Luca de Barrameda on the river Guadalquivir. Upstream there is the great port of Seville. Out there, I can look straight into the Atlantic. Today, San Luca is more famous for its Manzanilla wine and the grilled prawns that go so deliciously with it. But 500 years ago, Christopher Columbus left from this beach to discover America. And within 30 years of that, the Portuguese navigator Ferdinand Magellan left from here too. The 18 survivors of his voyage were the first people ever to have sailed right round the world. San Luca was the property of the Dukes of Medina Sidonia, whose palace still overlooks the town and its river. The Duke gave privileges to English merchants and even built them a church. He was happy to sell them wine, but he was equally happy to command the great armada that set out to conquer England. This coat of arms comes from his galleon. This was the paradox. As England became more and more nervous of Spain's growing power, the English fell in love with her delectable sack. I talked to Don Mauricio Gonzalez Gordon, the head of Gonzalez Bias. The sack was such a celebrated wine in Elizabethan times that one would really love to know just what it was like. Well, uh, if you look at this sherry, which is dry and you see the color is it's golden, I would imagine that sack was rather like that, more than that wine, which is much darker and sweet. And the other property of sack, of course, was that it traveled so well. Yes, uh, sack was wonderful wine for, for travel. I mean, it was uh, actually, Shelley was the first wine to go around the world. I mean, to circumnavigate the globe. With Magellan? That's right. Magellan, who, who got his boats ready in Sevilla, and he took great care to select his, his sherry for that trip. He spent nearly 40% of the money he, he used for stores, he spent on sherry. It's incredible. You mean more than on armaments and food? Oh, he spent less money on armament. Uh, uh, all his cannon and armor and swords and crossbows. He spent less money than on sherry. He was a clever man. He thought that to get around the world, it was easier done with sherry than with, with weapons. This was the great power base of Spain, the ramparts of Cadiz, defending the bay which contained the greatest naval dockyard of its day. By Queen Elizabeth's time, the English were so concerned about the threat of the Spanish fleet that they put together a sort of freelance navy. And admittedly, they were rather keen on the contents of the treasure galleons too. Sir Francis Drake was the unofficial admiral of this navy. Or if you took the Spanish point of view, the pirate chief. In 1587, Drake led a squadron of 27 ships into the harbor here at Cadiz. He destroyed the oars of the galleys sent out to meet him and sailed on into the dockyard to plunder and burn the galleons that were to have been sent against England. Drake even came sailing back in again the next day to finish off the job. Afterwards, he called it singeing the King of Spain's beard. And amazingly, he found the leisure to load onto his ships 3,000 barrels of sack that were standing on the beach. You can imagine that when that wine arrived in England, it created a sensation. The instant fashion for sack comes echoing down the years to us in the words of Shakespeare, who created the immortal Sir John Falstaff only a few years later. A good sherry sack hath a twofold operation in it. It ascends me into the brain, makes it apprehensive, quick, full of nimble, fiery, and delectable shapes which delivered over to the voice becomes excellent wit. The second property of your sheris is the warming of the blood. If I had a thousand sons, the first human principle I would teach them would be to forswear thin potations and addict themselves to sack. 
Despite Shakespearean publicity, though, Spain's wars caused difficulty for sherry growers. At the end of the 16th century, business was bad because of hostile relations with uh, markets and so on. Shippers found that they had an overstock of wine. So they started blending wines, the same sort of wines, but from different vintages. This blending eventually brought about a new quality of sherry, fino. Originally, it had all been what is now called oloroso, meaning strong, pungent wine. Sack, in other words. Then they invented the solera. It consists of topping up barrels of older wine with younger wine of the same kind each time you draw some off. So the wine you drink always comes out of the oldest barrel. So, Mauricio, how would you describe the special qualities of a fino? A fino is a dry, delicate, pale, Beautifully aromatic wine. I'll show you. Genaro, quieres echarnos dos copitas de, de vino, por favor? But you need a solera essentially to make a fino, is that correct? Yes, you need a solera to make a fino because, because you see the fino, the characteristics of the fino are brought about by this flor, the yeast which is on the surface and covers the wine. So that that will grow vigorously on the surface, you need to be constantly or regularly refreshing the older wine with the younger, which has all the nutrients and will keep that floor uh, growing. I can actually see some of the floor floating on the wine, little white specks. Yes, of course, because as he drew the Venetia from the cask, as the veil of floor on the surface is quite thick, well, there's always some little speck of floor coming into the glass. And perhaps that's what I can smell, the yeasty smell, which is almost like fresh bread. It's utterly delicious, it's terribly appetizing yes and even more if you if you sniff the floor itself i mean it's uh, quite yeasty so the next development in the history of sherry is that from the fino developed the third category of sherry the amontillado that's right yes if you if you leave a fino and uh, do not refresh it uh, for a time or you make the scales uh, run slower well you will find that the wine becomes nuttier a little darker in color and with a beautiful nose, uh, which is the, 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 the typical Amontillado, which is a dry wine. Strong wines like sherry were still, in the 1600s, the only ones that would travel and keep. All other light wines, such as claret, were perpetually at risk of going sour or worse. So much so that when England's Royal Society was founded in 1662 for the advancement of scientific knowledge, only the second discourse that was presented to it was this, on a subject I'm sure of interest to all its members, the mystery of vintners, or a brief discourse concerning the various sicknesses of wines and their respective remedies at this day commonly used. It speaks of wines that are turbulent in motion, thick of consistence, unsavory in taste, unwholesome in use, after which they undergo sundry alterations to the worse. But nowhere does this book mention bottles. But by the mid-1600s, about the time the book was written, a better remedy was discovered. In fact, the perfect one, the bottle. In England, glass technology was ready to produce the ideal, small, hygienic, reasonably cheap container in which wines could be sealed with an airtight seal. The secret known to the Romans with their sealed amphoras was to be rediscovered. Even light wines could mature for years, completely sealed off from the atmosphere with corks. This is a grove of cork trees. They grow in their thousands, wild in the mountains of Portugal and Spain. In fact, they're just a kind of oak with a thick protective bark, which can be stripped off every 10 years or so without hurting the tree, not when it's a big mature one like that. But this pile down here represents the 10 year crop of about 50 trees. Strange that the unique, perfect airtight seal for wine should be found growing wild in wine country. Because it was cork that made possible the new era of great quality wines.
Wine cannot be separated from the elements. Earth, air, the sun and the rain mould its character. What differences the earth, the soil can make is a passionately argued topic and the theme of this programme. Nowhere is it more closely studied than on the coat door, Burgundy's slopes of gold. It's not very impressive, is it? This really could be a field of vines anywhere in France. And yet this tiny plot, I don't mean the whole hill, but just the five acres in this corner here, is valued at the same sort of rate as a building site in the middle of Paris. Why? Because it makes the world's most expensive red wine. Its name is Romanée Conti, and princes have been proud to own it down the centuries. But why this one and not this one? All I've done is just to cross a little lane, and this is a vineyard with a different name, whose wines taste quite different, and are valued at only a fraction of the price. How can we make sense of this? Can such differences really represent reality? Nowhere else in the world are there such huge variations in price. But this is Burgundy. And to understand its complications, we must go right back to the beginning and see how it came about. Le Seigneur fait mourir et vivre. Il fait descendre à l'abîme et en ramène. Le Seigneur en pauvre et riche. Il abaisse et il élève Dieu. The vineyards of Burgundy, in the heart of France, were developed into something like their modern form by the monks of the Middle Ages. Above all, the Cistercians, whose abbey of Cito lies on the plain, only five miles from the Golden Slopes. The discipline and energy of this order found a perfect expression in the organization of winemaking. And it brought them unique prestige. The Pope himself could be won over by wine of the quality they produced. The monks' wine headquarters and the summit of their achievement was the Clos Vougeot, 125 acres of the best vineyard land enclosed by a wall and endowed with a magnificent but functional chateau. This 15th century wine press shows the technology of the Middle Ages, little changed since the Romans. In fact, huge pieces of equipment like this were still essential for making white wine right up until the last century. For white wine, of course, you need only the juice, not the skins. You could make red wine without a press, simply by treading the grapes. But a press was always used by those who could afford such an engine to extract the last 10% after the wine had fermented. The genius of the monks was not so much in technology as in tasting, and above all in distinguishing by taste between different parts of the vineyard. It is the essence of Burgundy, unique in the world, that its fields have identities, and the wine of one is not exactly like the wine of another. It was largely the refined palates of the monks that made these distinctions, and it was the monks' discrimination that set such very different values on different patches of soil. To me, this ruinous remnant of a 15th century cloister is a moving place to be. It's the oldest remaining fragment of the great abbey of Cito. The Cistercians' fortunes dwindled after the Middle Ages, if you can call it dwindling, when they still had 25,000 acres of land. Then with the French Revolution, it was all over. In 1790, a detachment of troops arrived and the abbot learned that the abbey 
and all its lands were confiscated. By chance, one of the young officers was called Napoleon Bonaparte. The confiscated lands were broken up and sold by auction. Only such very small fields as the five-acre Romany Conti have survived this process intact. The Clos Vougeau was subdivided again and again. Today it has 60 different owners. The result is that this landscape, apparently without boundaries, is divided first into the complicated field pattern established by the monks, then into the sometimes row-by-row -row holdings of very small farmers. The average Burgundy grower owns only 10 acres of this land, but lives in a village whose name is familiar round half the world. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'il va avec vous, madame, dans ce cadre Il y a des pommards, des volnets, des montlis, mais vous voudriez, vous voudriez peut-être déguster Ah oui, vraiment. Alors, madame Douaret is a typical example of a Burgundy grower. She invited me into her underground cellar to taste her wines. She explained that it holds eight different wines from four different villages. She and her sister inherited what is a fairly large holding by Burgundy standards, about 25 acres. With the French laws of inheritance, the tendency is for small holdings to get even smaller and smaller, more fragmented with each generation that inherits them. <coughs> the first wine we tasted was a red from Madame's vineyards in Montély. It struck me straight away as specially fragrant, full of the distinctive character of this village. This was the 1986 vintage. 86. The family's vineyards are in Montély, where they live, and scattered through the villages of Merceau for white wine, and Pomar and Volnay for red. This map of Volnay shows how each tiny field round the village has its own name, which can be used on the label of its own distinctive wine. Every vineyard is officially ranked too. White wines here are shaded green, but top quality ones yellow. This darker pink is the best red wine, always around the middle of the narrow slope, with more modest quality below and above. It makes it easier to understand the small but vital differences between wines if you consider the life of a vine as an individual. It's really strange to think that all the wine you ever drank was once sap sucked from the ground and coming up through a gnarled old stick like this. It's just flowering time now in June and you can already see the form of the future bunches of grapes in these bunches of flowers. There are about half a dozen of them on every plant. Between now and when they're picked in about four months' time, when of course they'll all be golden and juicy and sweet, just think of all the days and nights and the rain and the sun and the wind, and all the different conditions that will envelop this particular vine. Just over there, there's a wall. Now, if it casts a shadow early in the morning, its day will effectively start late, it'll ripen later. The sum of all these tiny differences is the character of a vintage and a wine. And the owner of a vineyard like this will know it so intimately that he can tell you how many bunches each vine has and how ripe they are. This model shows in the most ingenious and graphic way how the geology of Burgundy affects the vineyards and where they are. It exaggerates the vertical scale, so the hills look much bumpier than they are in truth. Now, what lies underneath it is layer upon layer of limestone rock. And because there is a major geological fault, it shows up very clearly as a sort of crest of a hill here, and then it breaks down to the plain. And because of that, the layers of limestone reach the surface as a sort of layer cake, and one crumbles down on top of the other, and you get a mixture of soils and stones and clays, which are ideal for growing the burgundy grapes. Ah oui, nous sommes là dans le canton Charlemagne. Oui. Et euh, bah, tenez, voici un magnifique oh, fossé oh. qui a été creusé. I went up into the famous vineyard of Canton Charlemagne with Noël Le Neuf, who is professor of geology at the University of Dijon. He showed me where a ditch caused by heavy rain and erosion had laid bare the subsoil and revealed the geological strata. Avec des calcaires durs et des calcaires tendres. Hard rocks of limestone alternate in layers with soft and crumbly material. 
On the surface, this forms the marl, or limey clay, which is the ideal Chardonnay soil of Corton Charlemagne. All this rock, hard and soft, has a high lime content. The professor showed me how you test for lime with a little squirt of hydrochloric acid. If it fizzes, you have limestone. And limestone is what gives Burgundy its quality and incredibly long life. Robert Lotel is a professional geologist who's consulted by the French national wine authorities. It was he who made this huge scale model of the vineyards of the Cote d'Or, south from the town of Beaune. So I can see a line which is colored yellow disappearing here, and then it seems to come up again here, is that right? That's right, because the rocks coming from there are going underground beneath Beaune, outcropping again here in Merceau, and getting up on that side. This is what the geologists call a syncline. A dip in, a dip, in, in right. what used to be the seabed. Right? Exactly, and because of the dip, you have the older rocks here, the same rocks here, and the younger rocks here, right in the middle. Now, here the yellow comes up, and I notice that we've suddenly got into the part where the white wine grows. That's right. It's because at the time of the deposition of the sediment, the depth of the sea was a little bit different, giving less lime and more clay, you have the right place to grow Chardonnay. So you're saying that Chardonnay and clay go together? That's right. More clay is better for Chardonnay. Alors vous avez devant vous un coteau. Out in the vineyards, Professor Leneuve gave me a graphic explanation of how it works on the hill of Corton. Starting at the bottom, on the flat land, the vineyards are of modest quality, partly because they drain less well. Between the road and the wall is mainly hard limestone, with an iron content you can actually see as red in the soil. Top quality red wines grow here. Above that is Court en Charlemagne, where we examined the ditch. Paler to look at, grey, limey clay, and world famous for its superlative white wine. So it really is a layer cake even to the icing at the top. The proof of this theory is in the cellar. The magic word Burgundians use for each different soil and situation is terroir. Here in the cellar of some of the most valuable terroirs of all, the Domaine de la Romanie Conti, one of its proprietors, Madame Lalou Bise-le-Roi, gave me the grower's point of view. It's a mystery. It's the inexplicable things in life which are perhaps the most beautiful the most elusive and the most wonderful. It is a fact that each of our Burgundy wines has its own terroir. Our ancestors established the identity of each wine and marked out there was Chambertin. There was La Latricière. There was Les Rochottes. It was as if they could actually taste the earth. It took them years of experience and experiment to be able to say, there is La Tache, there is Richbourg, there is Romani Conti. I asked whether the proved superiority of Romani Conti could be purely a matter of geology. It's certainly a geological fact. First, because of the subsoil, or rather the nourishing earth. It's particularly superb there. But analysis only proves what we already know, that the wine is full of finesse, full of elegance, full of everything that is a Romani Conti. And that is certainly due to its terroir. And could these distinctions between vineyards not be made anywhere else in France? Of course, every region in France has its own soils. And it's through the vine that the qualities of each terroir are revealed. But did each of those regions play the game like Burgundy did, by choosing just one grape variety, one key, the Pinot? No. Around Bordeaux, for example, they betray their terroir by mixing grape varieties to try and standardize their wine. We have chosen only one filter, only one key. That's the Pinot.
It was the medieval rulers of Burgundy, its dukes, with their court, famous for chivalry, who made the great decision to allow only one grape. Red Burgundy was already the favorite wine of the royal court in Paris, which made it a useful diplomatic instrument. In the 14th century, Philip the Bold encouraged all his subjects to plant the Pinot Noir, which clearly made the region's best wine. The Duke was enraged when, from this village where I'm standing, there emerged a new kind of grape, which grew far more abundantly than the wonderful Pinot Noir. Its name was the Gamay. One plant of Gamay gave three times as much wine as one of Pinot Noir. The crop came earlier, with less trouble, and not surprisingly, everybody started to grow it. But its wine, in the Duke's words, was foul, even harmful to human beings. He published a decree to banish it from his realms. Disloyal, he called it. In actual fact, it was a perfectly good grape, just growing in the wrong place. Banishment took it to the south, where a completely different soil transformed it into the fruity purple liquid that the whole world knows today, Beaujolais. And Gamay has no Gamay anymore. Burgundy's wine capital was and still is the little city of Bone, securely walled and moated and protected by the ducal castle. The ramparts still stand, although the moat is dry. In fact, Bone is still amazingly like its medieval portrait. The jewel in the crown of Bone is its magnificent medieval hospital, the Hospice, or Hotel Dieu. Its soaring spires and gables stand in the center of the town as a perpetual symbol of the marriage of wine and charity. It was founded in 1453 by the Duke's Chancellor, Nicolas Rolin. No doubt to expiate his sins, he endowed it for its income with vineyards in some of the best parts of the coat. The Duke of Burgundy's Chancellor evidently thought in terms of princely banqueting halls, even when what he was actually building was a refuge for the old and the sick and the dying. But 500 years ago, the idea of a town having its own, its very own hospital, was definitely avant-garde. And this must have been the world's most splendid, even if in the beds that stood here in those days, the poor patients were often packed four or five abreast. With the state of medicine as it was in the Middle Ages, perhaps it's not surprising that it was laid out rather like an antechamber before meeting one's maker. In fact, it was both a ward and a chapel. And to anyone in one of these beds who had a guilty conscience, in those days, there was a terrifying reminder above the altar of the judgment day to come. Sunday in November is a festive day in Bone. Its streets are packed with families whose tiny plots of vineyard provide a very handsome income. It's notable that foreigners own practically none of the coat door. They gather to see the annual auction of the wine from the vineyards of the Hospice, their hospital. The wines are sold by the barrel under the names of the benefactors who've given vineyards to the hospital over 500 years. Merchants and restaurant owners gather from all over the world for this first chance to taste and buy the wines of the new harvest. Bidding for each lot goes on until two tapers have burned down and gone out. Tension is high. The prices not only decide the hospital's income, they are signals to the world of the quality of the new vintage and the world's appetite for these rare fluids that only a few thousand acres of earth can produce. Each of these wines has a distinct character, hallowed by tradition, guaranteed by geology, and one of the world's great status symbols. 
This bidding is for a single barrel of wine, named after the founder of the hospital. It's going for 27,000 francs, so that's 90 francs a bottle while it's still in its barrel, before bottling, shipping and the rest. Prosperity has not been built, though, simply on these tiny quantities of esoteric wine sold one barrel at a time. Bone is the commercial capital, and its real rulers are its merchants, its négociants, who handle the vast bulk of its trade. Families such as the Bouchards, whose father-to-son succession goes back to the 18th century. The Bouchards are the present-day occupants of the Duke's old chateau. Their gardens are on the ramparts. The thick-walled bastions below are their cellars. Full of wine, they've either bought from small growers or grown on their own estate. When their ancestors came to Bone, there was very little trading in wine. The Bouchards and many others were cloth merchants. This is their original sample book. But as time went on, they turned the book over and into a wine list. The merchant's traditional role is to buy and blend together the produce of small growers. But today the trend is the other way. Growers are more and more bottling and selling their wine themselves, unblended, to emphasize the minute distinctions that make Burgundy unique. I talked to someone who's both a merchant and a grower, Robert Drouin. It would really be a pity not to distinguish uh, one wine from the other uh, it's interesting for the consumer to know exactly where the wine comes from. It, it is also interesting to differentiate the, the quality. These are subtleties. The nuances are not that great, but it's really uh, worth it to try and make a difference. Does it, it make, sorry, does it make commercial good sense, though? It makes it difficult. But as you said, it makes it unique. You see, we are not, uh, this is not a drinking wine we, we, we try and produce. When we sell our wines, when we produce our wines, it's not only a beverage, how, however good it is. It's a wine from Burgundy, from Beaune, from Montrachet, from Chambertin, from Claude Mouche, and so on. And those who purchase th these wines, they enjoy, if they have been privileged enough to come to Burgundy, they relate the quality of the wine and the wine they drink to the village, to the history of Burgundy, to the old, uh, to the cities. To the to the Hospice de Beaune and so, so you're on. saying that Burgundy is really more than a wine. It's a sort of um, cultural experience. Yes, we sell we sell tradition. We sell the history of Burgundy. We sell somewhat of a dream. And in this modern world where everything is so standardized, I think it's nice to go back to the to the roots of the history of wine. Burgundy's formula certainly works. The great functional farm building of the Cistercian monks in the Clos Vougeot is the scene today of regular banquets for up to 600 guests of the Chevalier de Tastevin. Burgundy is accused of being elitist, of catering only for the rich with the fabulous prices of its wines. Its reply might well be that the same policy has paid for a thousand years. When the world demand outstrips supply, you have a seller's market. There are plenty of people, wine drinkers as well as wine growing rivals, who would like to see it all exposed as a confidence trick. 
But to do that, they would have to produce another wine with the same enduring appeal elsewhere, to find another slope of gold. Among all the world's great wines, only one is credited with an individual inventor. The wine is champagne, and the man held responsible, rightly or wrongly, a Benedictine monk. This is him, Dom Perignon. He held the post of treasurer in this abbey of Auvillers, right in the heart of the Champagne country, in northeast France, in the reign of Louis XIV, the Sun King. The Sun King's reign brought the dawn of grandeur and elegance on a scale not seen in Europe since the Romans. His palace at Versailles symbolized the unprecedented wealth and sophistication of his court. The time was ripe for new wines, for lives of luxurious leisure. The Benedictine Abbey of Auvillers was rich in lands. It overlooks the valley of the Marne from splendid vineyard slopes. Dom Perignon, as its treasurer, was responsible for organizing every aspect of this rich foundation. The brothers worked in vineyards, farms, fields, forests and workshops, and he directed them all. But he took a special pride in its wines, already among the best of a region that was considered to make some of the finest wines in France. They were pale red, made in the style of the time from both black grapes and white together. Father Perignon, you were the first person to practice scientific winemaking, what we'd call enology today. You were the first enologist. There are so many legends about you. They say that you were the first person to make sparkling wine. They say that you were the first person to use bottles and corks together. They say you were blind, which I can see you weren't. Above all, they say you had the most remarkable sense of taste. And just by popping a grape in your mouth, you could say definitively whether it was grown on this hill or in that valley. How much of this is true? I'm three centuries too late for a direct answer. But let's start at the beginning. What is champagne, and why? To start with, it's a place, a region northeast of Paris, the northernmost in France to grow wine at all. Its position at the meeting of many roads has made Reims, its capital, one of the great commercial centers since the time of the Romans. In the Middle Ages, its famous cloth fairs were a good outlet and advertisement for its wines. With prosperity and investment, they flourished, until they were famous in Paris, only a few days down the River Marne, for their exceptional lightness, and above all, their fragrance. This super quality is inbuilt in both the soil and the climate. Well, here the soil is chalk, if you can call it soil white, solid, rocky chalk that you could write on a blackboard with. But it does reflect light onto the vines, which helps the grapes to ripen. The roots go deep in it, the drainage is good. It's wonderful for fine wines, so long as you give the plants something to grow in. You have to enrich the soil year after year and cover it with manure, bring in vegetable matter. The other quality of chalk lies underground. 
It's easily dug and carved into spacious cellars where the temperature never varies, summer or winter. Mile upon mile of cellars under reams were dug as quarries for building stone by the Romans 2,000 years ago. Reams were strategically placed not only for trade, but for great events. In its great cathedral, all the kings of France were crowned. It was at Reims that Joan of Arc, having routed the English in battle, crowned the Dauphin as King Charles VII. But such a vital crossroads was also a constant cockpit for war. Champagne still bears the scars of the greatest tragedy of history, the Great War, when Reims was destroyed, its cathedral bombarded and shelled into a roofless ruin by Germans who refused to believe it was not being used as an observation post. The American poet Alan Seeger, who was killed in the trenches along the Marne in 1916, in his poem Champagne, crystallizes the paradox of celebration and death. In the glad revels, in the happy fates when cheeks are flushed and glasses gilt and pearled with the sweet wine of France that concentrates the sunshine and the beauty of the world, drink sometimes you whose footsteps yet may tread the undisturbed, delightful paths of earth. To those whose blood in pious duty shed, hallows the soil where that same wine had birth. These vineyards, overlooking the battlefield, occupy the high ground of the so-called Mountain of Reims, crowned with still dense forest. Champagne divides tidally into villages grouped round the mountain and the Marne Valley, mainly growing black grapes, the Pinot Noir and the Meunier, and villages across the Marne on south and east slopes whose grapes are white. Today, both make white wine. The marriage of the two is the secret of Champagne. And this is the white grape slope, the Côte des Blancs, which faces south behind me, where the village of Avies is one of the best Grand Cru. Over there is Cramont, another famous village. The afternoon sun is flooding the slopes with light, and of course all the grapes are the famous Chardonnay. It's obvious you can make white wine from Chardonnay, but how do you make white wine from black grapes? With extreme care is the answer. This was one of Dom Perignon's great contributions to realize that the flavor of Pinot Noir is wonderful in white wine without the tannin from its skin. A very important part of the business of getting pure white juice out of black grapes is to make sure that they're not rotten and perished. Because if they are, then the grapes will give a pink tinge to the wine and you've got pink wine instead of white champagne. I've got to get rid of ladybirds like that. In fact, this way of doing it, what's called triage, which is taking away all the rotten berries, was pure Dom Perignon perfectionism. There used to be lines of ladies in the vineyards throwing out every rotten little berry like that, cutting them off, chucking them away, but nowadays, it's much less of a problem than it used to be. You don't get an awful lot of rot. Things get to the press house so much quicker.
presses that manage to get the juice out without the colour are unique to Champagne. They're huge, four tonnes of grapes at a time. And they press very gently, just enough to burst the berries without crushing the skins. You take how many in the cuvée? Ten pieces, the 200, 250 litres. Only the juice of the first pressing will make top quality wine. 2,000 litres or 10 barrels of it. Juice from the second and third pressings will not be used to make champagne. For all the forklifts and the sheer scale of the thing, the principle is just the same as in Dom Perignon's day. And this is the actual miniature grape press that Dom Perignon used here in the Abbey of Ovier to make his experimental little blends. He used grapes from all over the vineyard lands of the Abbey, black grapes and white grapes, and he'd make separate little lots in this press of his, and then he'd blend them together to see what was really going to make an ideal champagne. Ovier wine on its own is very, very full-bodied. Now, with a touch of sillery, from another village, you get a bit of lift and liveliness in the wine. Then with a bit of boozy, which is from another village in the region, you get what the French call carpentry, which is structure and firmness in your mouth. Then another element has to be some white grape wine from the Côte des Blancs, which rounds the whole thing out harmoniously, gives it a bit of nuttiness and different aromas altogether. Dom Perignon's great achievement, really, was that he made France's best Subtlest wine by developing the art of blending. Alors là, on a le chardonnay. Oui, mais tu as le chardonnay, mais cette année, il apparaît comme tout de même un peu clairé, un peu acide, etc. All champagne is blended, but the recipe is the secret of each firm or house, as they call them. Le Pinot Noir, c'est extraordinaire. A committee tastes the new wine of each vineyard separately then judges how much of each should go into the final blend. The final blend is called the assemblage. The boss's nose is all important. I'm really fascinated to know how you maintain a house style from year to year. Is that a very difficult thing to do? Yes, because in Champagne we are at the northern limit of the vine, which means that the crop varies considerably in quantity from one year to another. You can have one million a year, you can have 500,000 the next one and the quality may be very different also. Therefore, this is how the champagne has established itself as a blend. It was compulsory that you should combine from various villages, that is the cuvee. And it's important with champagne. Champagne, of course, is bubbles, but also it's, before anything, it's wine. Bubbles are made all around the world, as you know. Champagne is unique. Right. I'll tell you what I'd love to do, and that's to compare this assemblage with uh, with the yellow label to see whether I can see that they are the same wine. Un petit peu nous verser chacun. So there you have the Verflico style. It isn't so different after all. It's exactly the same style. There's plenty of body. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a classic but it's, wine. It, it's more it's more powerful now that yes. it's finished, yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Much more powerful flavours, more powerful aromas. There's another thing about it; it's much harder to spit out. I think nobody wants to. <laughs> <laughs> Dom Perignon is said to have remarked, "I'm drinking stars," but the champagne that he and his monks so carefully blended was a still wine. What about the bubbles, though? The upstart bubbles. Strange to say, they weren't part of Dom Perignon's invention at all. And a vulgar fad was what the French considered them. The invention, which I suppose was really more of a discovery, 
was made by the frivolous English. It was the London of King Charles II that first experienced the fun of fizz. Still champagne was shipped in barrels in winter, then bottled and corked. Opened in the spring, it was sparkling. Soon the secret got back to France and took the fancy of the fast set in Paris with their little suppers. Conservatives disapproved. Bubbles in their favorite wine? But why does it sparkle? Simply because the fermentation only seems to have stopped when winter comes. The cold weather is enough to prevent any little bit of sugar that may be left in the wine from turning into alcohol and gas. Now in a barrel, if it did, the gas would escape and you wouldn't know. But you put it in a bottle and tie the cork on tight and there's nowhere for the gas to go. It can't escape. And carbon dioxide can dissolve in wine. Now you pop the cork and this lovely new invention, froth, comes out followed by wine that just goes on and on, sparkling and sparkling, as all the gas that was dissolved in it undissolves. Champagne came to be identified with celebration as no other wine had been. It grew with the taste for luxury, and the taste for luxury grew with champagne. By the end of the 18th century, it had turned Reims and its neighbor Epernay into towns as prosperous as any in France. Epernay has its Champs-Élysées of Champagne, a street where every house is a mansion and a factory combined. The litany of brand names is like a roll call of celebration. Paul Roger, Bollinger, Krug, Roderer, Pommery, Perrier Jouet, Heidsieck, Clico, Tetanger, Ruinard, De Castellan, Mercier, Mam, Moet et Chandon. Most successful of all the merchants in this sparkling trade was Jean Rémy Moet, a friend and of course supplier to Napoleon and Josephine, for whom he built this elegant pavilion just for lunch. I imagine this transaction took place afterwards. Is the emperor reaching for his credit card? The other great legendary figure in the development of Champagne was a young woman. Her name was Mademoiselle Nicole Ponsardin, but she's much better known to history as La Veuve Clicquot, the widow Clicquot. And this is a portrait of her in her comfortable old age. I'd love to have known what she looked like when she was younger, because she started her own champagne firm when she was only 27. Napoleon had just been driven back from his march on Moscow, and the Russian army was bivouacked around Reims. They were soon looting the widow's cellars. Let them drink, she said. They'll pay later. And they did. She sent salesmen to Moscow and St. Petersburg, and she was, you might say, sitting pretty. From that moment, champagne became an international luxury with a potential world market. The widow's work was largely done underground. She tackled the tricky practicalities of producing champagne on an industrial scale, and there were daunting problems. A large proportion of the bottles exploded, wasting huge quantities of wine. Visitors down here were given iron masks to protect their faces. So strong bottles were needed, and a scientific way of adjusting the pressure inside them. It was done in the end by adding a precise measure of sugar and yeast to produce a calculated amount of carbon dioxide and, of course, the alcohol that goes with it. How to make it reliably fizzy was one problem, but the real devil to solve was how to make it clear. Because when wine ferments in the bottle, it creates thousands of dead yeast cells. And here they are and altogether they make it look much more like soup than wine. Look at them drifting around there. Nobody would want to drink of stuff like that. History credits the widow Clico herself with finding the ideal solution. What she did was she took her kitchen table and in it she cut holes at an angle of 45 degrees. Now she stuck the finished bottles of wine down in the holes and naturally the yeast in the wine started to go down towards the cork. Now, by giving each bottle a twist and a shake, every day, 
she managed to stop the yeast sticking to the glass so that it all finally got down resting on the cork. But imagine doing that to tens of thousands of bottles. This is exactly what these remueurs, or movers, are doing. And they spend a lifetime doing it. A skilled man can twist and shake 30,000 bottles a day. Nearly all champagne firms now have very large machines that can do the same thing. But there's still a mystique about doing it by hand. It's still how top quality champagne is made. The widow developed a production line for champagne. Once the wine has re-fermented, upside down, and its yeast has been coaxed to rest on its cork, it's ready for disgorging. The dégorgeur pops the cork and out flies the yeasty, cloudy part. The bottle is then topped up with what they call a dosage, which used to be several spoonfuls of sugar dissolved in champagne. The Russians liked it really sticky. Then the second and final cork has to be rammed firmly home. And to stop it flying out, tied down, nowadays with wire, but then with string and ingenious knots. It all looks quite different today. The principle is just the same, but one great labor and wine-saving device has come in. The upside-down bottles have their necks dunked in a freezing mixture that congeals the murky, yeasty part of the contents into a plug of ice. When the cork, nowadays a metal cap, is popped, the ice flies out like a bullet a machine tops up the bottle, another rams in the core, and another cages it with wire. Then the bottle is given a good rousing shake and sent on its way. If there is a temple of champagne, it's surely here at Maxime's in Paris, the most famous restaurant of the capital of folly and the headquarters of the Belle Epoque. A few years ago, they re-upholstered the benches round here, these plush benches, and believe it or not, down the back, they found gold rubles left over by the Russian archdukes who've been flinging them around by the fistful to pay for their champagne. Drinking of champagne out of actresses' slippers, though. Not bad. It probably happened at Maxime's, though, as with the bubbles, the English got there a hundred years before Maxime's opened its doors. And what's more, the gentleman in question liked it so much that he sent the slipper down to the kitchen, he had it cooked, and he ate it for dinner. Was that the sort of thing you had in mind, Dom Perignon? You 
find me at Maxine's Where all the girls are dreams They smile at you so sweetly Embrace you indiscreetly Lo, lo, do, do, juju Lo, clo, margo, fru, fru One kiss and I completely forget the At Maxim's once again With magnums of champagne When people ask what bliss is I simply tell them this is Lo, lo, do, do, juju Lo, clo, margo, fru, fru And when it comes to kissing Goodbye, my father Vintage is made possible by the Banfi Foundation. Banfi is an American winemaking family whose noble vineyard estate and cellars lie in the heart of Tuscany. Banfi, vintners dedicated to a better wine world. The whole town of Saint Emilion is a warren of these caverns. Many of them are lined with the barrels of the chateau and vineyards directly overhead. Others are catacombs with tombs going back, as legend has it, to the hermit Saint Emilianus, who gave the town its name. His bones are here. The sepulchre of the legendary saint leads directly into Saint Emilion's most remarkable monument. J'appelle Monsieur Derek Nemo. A whole church quarried into the solid limestone. The underground church is today's meeting place for the Jurat de Saint-Emilion, the organization for the promotion of the town and its wine. Enrolling the occasional celebrity, actor or politician is good for propaganda. Monsieur Nemo, vous êtes acteur, vous êtes comédien, Vous êtes metteur en scène et vous êtes également auteur. Ce dont je ne doute pas de toute façon, de bien vouloir vous accepter au sein des membres de la jurade. Monsieur le procureur s'indique, s'il vous plaît. Messieurs les jurats, jurez-vous de donner à votre vigneron d'honneur de la jurade
he is invited into the bosom of the brotherhood. C'est joli. Une épitaphe. Well, theoretically, in fact, it's rabbit. Oh. <laughs> Not rabbit. Well, let us say it's yeah, I mean, Put a yeah, bit yeah, of black on it. Yeah, I mean. Okay. Uh, and uh, English leopards, c'est le sceau de la commune de Saint-Emilion. When can I wear this, then? Everywhere where you have an official Saint-Emilion ceremony. I see. Which yeah. is in many places in England, anyway. The Jorad was founded in the year 1200 as the jurisdictional body of the town by King John of Magna Carta fame. He was as loved in Aquitaine as he was despised in England. John inherited as his realm most of Western France, as well as England. They were to remain united for a period of almost 300 years. It was claret that gave Saint-Emilion its importance. To this day, claret is a uniquely English word. It means the clear light wine that was ready for shipping early to be in every town in England in time for Christmas. Once a barrel was broached, though, it went off in a matter of weeks. When it was too vinegary to drink, they added honey. On the King's Tower in Saint-Emilion, the Jorad still proclaims the good news of the new vintage of fresh claret, the staple drink of medieval England. Men held the king's army together, especially before battles. And perhaps most important of all, it provided the basis for the first northern navies. What else was there, after all, in those days that needed substantial ships in large numbers with skillful crews to man them? Wine was, in fact, the bulk commodity of the time, rather the way oil is today. Even today, the capacity of a ship is measured in tons. In other words, how many big barrels of wine it could carry. Of all the regular wine routes of the Middle Ages, the most important was from Bordeaux to England. For three centuries, they were in effect one kingdom, England and Aquitaine, and the English drank almost the entire crop of the Bordeaux vineyards. A few years ago, I retraced the route on the nearest sort of ship to an old wine trader that could be found, the Bark Marques. Bigger than most medieval cogs, as they were called, but subject to just the same sailing conditions in the notoriously rough Bay of Biscay. In the English Channel, we hit some of the dirty weather we expected. It blew up to force 10, a gale and a half by landlubber's standards. This is the way millions of barrels of claret, as we still call it, reached England. And a proportion didn't. As many as 400 ships would congregate in the port of Bordeaux each October to collect the new wine and rush it to England in a sort of medieval Beaujolais race. This is the great estuary of the Gironde. Let me draw you a map. This is the Atlantic coast here. And the estuary comes out to sea widening like this. Now, all that land here between the estuary and the Atlantic is the Medoc. Bordeaux is this cross here. Down to Bordeaux, winding from inland, is the river Garonne. It comes down from an area known as the High Country. 
Now, in that high country, there are famous wine names like Caor and Gaillac, whose wines are, in fact, better in the Middle Ages than the wines of Bordeaux, and the people of Bordeaux knew it. So they were quite ruthless in preventing the wines using their natural course down the river and out to sea to export. They simply stopped them here in Bordeaux. However, there's another river, the Dordogne, which winds down here and joins the estuary below Bordeaux. So there wasn't much the people of Bordeaux could do about that. And on that river was the famous wine town of Saint-Emilion. Saint-Emilion lies on a limestone ridge above the Dordogne Valley. Here and in the country round, the wines they made were, and still are, a degree more alcoholic than the very light wines of Bordeaux city. Alcohol helped them to travel better. And the same limestone that gave them extra strength provided them with perfect cellars for cool fermentation, a factor in keeping them stable. The way that barrels are made has scarcely changed in the past 500 years. The hewing of wood, the careful shaping of a completely wine-tight container with fire and water, are crafts that relate directly to the old way of building a boat. Both represent the high technology of the Middle Ages. Even non-producing countries drank wine in quantities that needed a whole fleet of small ships to carry it. The problem was that it turned to vinegar within a year. This program is about the transport of wine and the discovery of the first kind that would keep. To England, the wine fleet was specially important. First of all, to the king, because it provided, of course, his pleasure and his comfort and a very special present that he could give his friends. But much more than that, it provided his income. At one point in the Middle Ages, his income from taxing wine was as much as all the rest of his revenue combined. And there was even more to it than that. Why?